Welcome once again to Research Methods. The last time we met, we talked about literature referencing. And previously, we also talked about how to select a topic and how to do literature review. Today, we will step into something a little bit more complex in trying to discuss the role of theory in research. So we'll talk about theoretical frameworks and conceptual frameworks, which together form a research framework for every researcher that, every research that you are going to carry out. Okay. Now, one thing that we all know about research is the fact that research is a systematic and organized way of finding answers to questions. And interestingly, we have discussed these things over the past uh, few sessions that we have done. Today, we'll go into details and try to understand how we use theories and conceptual frameworks to be able to establish certain relationships in the phenomenon we are trying to study and able to collect data on them. So we are going to discuss the role of research frameworks in research. So what are the topics we'll be covering in defining research framework, types of research frameworks, building blocks of a theory, examples of theories, and a level of theory. This session is actually linked to the chapter five of the book Research Made Easy, which you can also get on Google Books. So defining research frameworks. A research framework presents a way of studying variables concerning a phenomenon in order to investigate the solution for a research problem. We usually call it research framework because it frames the research. By what do I mean by it frames the research? It outlines certain variables or concepts in a manner which explains or predicts the research, um, the specific social phenomenon within a research problem. For example, you are trying to do a study on unemployment. You can think about or postulate economic factors that lead to unemployment. And you may mention inflation. You may mention um, something like lack of startup capital. You also mention another thing as maybe um, lack of low interest rates. If these three factors together interact in a manner to produce or have an effect in society which leads to unemployment, then you, you may be postulating your research that these three factors either either independently or they interact together to, be, to create unemployment in a society. Hence, you may go to a community or a particular society to test whether these three factors independently or interact together to predict unemployment in that particular society. So that's why we call it a research framework. So for that particular research, those three questions become or determine the variables that you are going to study. They also determine what goes onto your questionnaire. So it will frame the research, for the research you are carrying out for you. You are not going to ask questions outside those three variables. It doesn't mean that you may not find out that there may be other variables. Yes, you could find out that there may be other variables causing unemployment, but you may even find out the social cultural var variable, maybe the culture of the town. So certain social pra um, cultural practices could prevent women from working or men from working on specific days and maybe lead to certain uh, effects that may lead to uh, generate unemployment. However, because you have said that these three economic factors is what you are studying, those three factors will guide the research questions that you have. Hence, we say that it frames the research. And that's why we have research framework. So it's called a research framework because it frames the research. It outlines relationships, how concepts and variables relate to explain or predict a particular social phenomenon. Now, a research framework forms part of your literature review. Or uh, for a simple outline of a long essay can look like our thesis can look like this. An abstract introduction, literature review, context of study, chapter, um, chapter four being research methodology, results and discussion, and then conclusion. Within this, you use the introduction to establish why you are doing the research. So you present your research gaps there, uh, and which will be discussed within your research problem. Then you talk about the significance of your research. But when you get to literature review, what will you do is that you explain the concepts behind the research topic. So if you're doing something about unemployment, you may define what you mean by unemployment, you may define what you mean by poverty. And then you review the literature to see what has literature said concerning unemployment, what are the causes of unemployment. So because of that, you use your chapter two to explain a potential set of factors, the potential set of factors that could lead to unemployment. And out of that, if you find out about seven factors that literature says, that these factors predict unemployment in a society. You could choose 
four or three of them for your study. And the ones you choose for your study then becomes your research framework. So your research framework can come or emerge out of your literature review. But if you are doing a research-based thesis like MPhil or like a PhD, you may have a separate chapter for a research framework. Because that one, the depth of contribution is quite rigorous than that of an MBA program, of an MNC program, of an undergraduate program. So your supervisor may encourage you to have a chapter three called theoretical framework or research framework. But now that you are, you are just, I'm just giving a generic example here, a research framework will form part of your literature review, an outcome of literature review which provides direction for data collection and analysis. So it will end up informing what will be in the methodology. To end up informing what will be in the methodology. So let's, look at, let's just look at an example. This is a research that was done on impact of mobiles on micro trading activities of traders. So the key question was, what is the impact of mobiles on micro trading activities of market traders? And the questions that were being asked are, th are three sub questions. How do market traders use mobiles? One, what benefits do market traders obtain from mobiles? Two, what is the impact or benefits of using mobiles in micro trading activities of market traders? So these three questions were going to be used to collect data to be able to answer the underpinning research question. To be able to do this, the researcher had to come up with a research framework. Those variables, concepts, or those variables that will help the researcher collect data in order to answer each of the sub-research questions. So if you read the paper, which is easy for you to find in Emerald, a conceptual framework was developed and it was titled Conceptual Framework of the Impact of Mobiles on Micro Trading. And the conceptual framework was bringing those variables that need to be studied to, to answer the research question. And it emerged out of a literature review. So the author said that a, a trader will adopt mobile phone, and after adopting mobile phone, use it in three ways. In pre-trade activities, during trade activities, and post-trade activities. And it will generate three types of benefits, strategic benefits, relational benefits, and operational benefits. And to lead to three types of impact, incremental impact, transformational impact, and then production effects. Now, or incremental effects, transformational effects, and production effects. Now, what you see here is each part of the research questions, some research questions you saw in the previous slide has a contribute or has a relationship with the conceptual framework. So the pre-trade, the during trade and post-trade answers the first question, what do they use it for? They apply to these three areas, but the actual activities they use them for will come out of the research. But if you, if you look at it, this is the stages of trading, which is in economics. So the what the researcher did is that he took the stages of trading from economics and then said if the mobile phone is applied to trading, it will affect pre-trade, post-trade, and then during trade. Then in terms of benefits, literature has already discussed in a number of different papers that technologies like mobiles, when you apply them to commerce or trading, you can have three interrelated benefits, operational, relational, and strategic. And there are three types of effects that you can also lead to, incremental, transformational, and production. All these are coming from different authors. This one, the impact can be read from um, Hicks and Jaguar's paper in 2008. Uh, then you can also look at the benefits from other um, ICT-based papers. I've already actually written a paper on the use of mobiles and, um, and trading and the benefits you can gain from mobiles. And I also use the same strategic benefits, relational benefits and operational benefits. Even ICT application to commerce, you can have strategic benefits relational benefits, operational benefits. So by putting them together, he has a conceptual framework. And each of them, each of the questions is addressed here. So we say that a research framework helps you to be able to postulate how potential or observed variables from the literature come together to explain what you are trying to study. And that is why we call it a research framework. It frames a research. So the means that the researcher is, will be within the limits of these variables. Within the, within the limits of these variables. Now, it means that if a person is doing, uh, let's give an example. If you are preparing cake and you put the cake into a round bowl, a round cast, what you said, you have a round cake. But if you put it in a square box, by the time you, you come out of the oven, you get a square box. 
a, a square a, a kick of a square size what i'm trying to say here is that the variables guide you to be able to collect data it means that by the time you finish sometimes the variables can limit you in what you can report it doesn't also mean that you might not find out new things you can find out new things but the variable kind of lead and direct the part of the research so the questions in the quest on your questionnaire is guided by the variables which you select to do your research in in the same way if a person is doing research and says that social cultural factors that affect unemployment you better you realize all the factors will be social cultural factors if it says economic factors it, all the factors will be economic factors that is what a research framework does now there are different types of research framework now, to make it simple, a research framework can be viewed in two parts. First, there is, you could go into theory. Now, theory is an observed pattern about how things work in society, how variables come together to explain a, so, um, a social phenomena. Now, one thing about theories is that they have been tested over time and become established. So they look like a given truth. One example is you're finding the area of a circle. Mm. Is it pi r squared? Or the area of a triangle, half base times height. Now it has been established in literature and in my science that this is how it is done. So after some time, we all accept that that is what we are going to use. But if you realize that sometimes in life, it's not everything that comes in a circle or it comes in a, a triangle. There are some odd shapes in, 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 in uh, all shapes of, of different artifacts in society, like a stone. It might not have it will not be round, perfectly round, or perfectly in a triangle format. So how will you find the area of a stone or it doesn't fit one of the shapes that you want? It means that you have to adapt different equations or different types of um, areas that you have established in literature. For example, if, if you have a rectangle and you are, you are looking for the area to be breadth times height. However, if you have another shape, it's not a rectangle, but it has some Pass which looks like a rectangle. What you can do is to divide it in different sections and find the, the each of the areas and then add them up. So for each of the things, you have to improvise. You have to try to find a way of adapting the existing formula for finding the area of a rectangle to what you are trying to do. In other words, sometimes a person carrying out a research can either go from the theory and then use the theory adapt it or modify it to be able to explain or study the social phenomenon. Now sometimes the theories are not sufficient. What the issue you are trying to study, there seems to be no theory that exists. However, there may be factors that can people have found in different types of research that could affect what you are trying to study. For example, there may not be one specific theory that explains unemployment or why somebody becomes an entrepreneur. So one of the things that you can try to see is that you may read the literature and you'll find several factors. Out of the factors, you may put it together and then develop what we call a conceptual framework. And that conceptual framework can be developed from a review of the literature. For example, let me go back. This is a conceptual framework on the impact of mobiles on micro trading. There was no model like this in the literature. This was a different model in the literature. This was a different model in the literature. This is a different model in the literature. So what you see here is that the author then reads and put them together to conceptualize how these variables should come together to explain the social phenomenon of the impact of mobiles on micro trading so we call that one a conceptual framework the conceptual framework is, is usually suggested nobody you have not yet tested them so it's suggested whilst theories have been observed and established empirically conceptual framework try to suggest how relationships will create we created within a particular social phenomenon. Theorists will look at observed relationships among a particular set of factors to predict or explain something. This will suggest. But sometimes we can pick a theory, adapt it, and modify it. And by the time we modify it, now it, does not, it looks like it's something different. So it now becomes also conceptual. Either from a modified theory or conceptual from a review of literature. So you can either have a conceptual framework or a theoretical framework for your research. But both of them form your research framework. Okay, I'm going to show you some examples. Let's say a theory is a set of general propositions used as principles of explanation, understanding, and prediction of apparent or observed relationships 
of certain observed phenomena. So apparent relationship of certain observed phenomena. Every theory has been empirically tested and verified before we take it as a theory. And one interesting thing about theories is that they can either be shown in the schematic form as a diagram or in a mathematical equation, like pi r squared, like half base times size. Good. So from our childhood, when we were in high school, we have actually been exposed to theories of life. But sometimes it, when you mention the word theory, others may think that it's quite far-fetched, but it's something that we actually use in society to be able to understand how social systems work or how uh, things work in the, in the world. So let's take this one example, a research framework or, the, or a theoretical framework. Now, this is a theory of plant behavior, which was developed by Ajahn in 1991. It talks about certain factors that can predict somebody's intention to perform a behavior and then the actual performance of the behavior. He says that attitude towards the behavior, the degree to which you have a good or a favorable attitude towards the behavior, can inform your intention to perform it. Then the subjective norm, the norms in society that influences you. It can be peer influence, it can be societal influence. Or if it, it can even be pressure coming from other peers or coming from other external reference systems. For example, you go to a school and everybody is using an iPhone and you feel pressure to also buy an iPhone. So you have got subjective norms. Then you, you said, we, according to the theory, attitude and subjective norm influence intention. However, there's another factor called perceived behavioral control, which can also influence intention. By perceived behavioral control means that your own assessment of the individual impediments or situational impediments that can influence or limit the performance, the intention to perform the behavior or the performance of the behavior. What do I mean by that? Let's take an example. You want to go to sleep in a very nice hotel, like the Four Seasons in the U.S. or Moving Pick in Ghana. You enjoy, you've heard about them, you want to go there and have a good time. Now, so you have a favorable attitude towards the intention of going to the hotel because you have read about it on the internet. Reference people have even recommended it, so you are even happy about it. Number two, subjective norm. It's likely that maybe a friend has attended, slept in moving pick before, or visited moving pick hotel, or had the wedding in moving pick hotel, and has told you about it. So now you are pressured by your friends or by your peers. Or it could also be that there's so much noise about the adverts on TV, so you are kind of drawn to it. So, so some societal influence, you are drawn to it in going to moving pick to have a good time. Now, if you go to moving pick, whether you can spend one day, two days, three days, four days, or whether you can eat lunch buffet, um, evening um, uh, supper buffet, or dinner buffet, and spend the rest of the time having fun there for a week or two or three to a month, depends on what is in your pocket. Is that not true? Depends on how much cash you may have been able to pay, your ability for you to pay for the services that you're going to get from moving pay. So we say that perceived behavioral control are the situational impediments or individual impediments that can limit your intention to perform the behavior or even if you intend, it can actually affect your performance. Yes, you have intended to go to moving pick, but how long can you stay in moving pick? One week? This will determine that. Now, it's very interesting that you can relate to this, to this particular theory because it's a theory. It's explains, you see, I didn't say attitude toward going to move and pick in here. The theory says attitude toward the behavior. They, so it means that this theory can be applied to different behavioral um, phenomena in society. So why do some nurses l use computers and some nurses don't use computers? You could use a theory like this to maybe explain individual behaviors. Why do some um, students like this saving in a particular bank and then avoid the other bank. It could be the same thing. So every type of behavior, social behavior that has been observed, this theory can be able to give you some understanding about it. And because you can apply it, it means that it's, it's an abstract form. It doesn't have specifics that are only defined for a particular behavior. It's in an abstract form, so it can be applied to different scenarios. That it and it helps you to understand planned behavior. Now, I also said the theory can be expressed as what? An, a schematic form and then 
an equation. This is an example of an equation. This is a theory of reason action. It is out of this that the theory of plan behavior was built. So you see that here we have the overall interaction is equal to, or it's a function of a person's attitude plus a person's subjective norm with the weights being put, the derived weights being put there. So in that, in that form is an equation. Another equation can be half base times height, which is the area of a triangle, or breadth times weight will give you the area of a rectangle, or pi, pi r square will give you the area of a circle. So you have different types of equations in which a theory can be expressed as. Now, the other type of thing that we mentioned as a research framework is a research framework can also exist as a conceptual framework, meaning that the current theories are not sufficient in explaining what you are trying to do. So you read the literature and find some factors and put them together. Or you tend to extend or modify a theory so that now it becomes adapted to your study. And that makes it conceptual. So you are suggesting that this is how it will work. Now let's take an example. This is a conceptual framework about factors which influence, contribute or cause unemployment. Develop out the literature review. Someone is arguing that four variables lead to unemployment. So you see H1, H2, H3, A4. These are hypotheses. So you see that he's trying to emphasize here that low wages can lead to unemployment, political instability, lack of startup capital, and high interest rates. So when he's doing his research, his research will be framed by these questions. All these are independent variables leading to one outcome, a dependent variable. So the ability for unemployment to occur mm, is an, a function of low wages, political instability, lack of startup capital, and what? High interest rates. So that's how it's a factor-based model. Factors leading to one particular outcome. And it's conceptual. He's developing out of literature. He's yet to test and prove it. And after it's been tested and proved empirically for several times, in several scenarios, you can then be able to come up with maybe a theory of unemployment. But that's a little bit far-fetched. Okay. Now, another person can also build a conceptual framework on students' visit to the mall. Students' attitude to or uh, visit to the mall. What is he doing? What is he doing here? He's trying to modify or adapt the theory of planned behavior to studying the behavior of going to the mall. So what he has done here is that he has now in changed the individual items about going to the mall with what? With elements that try to or variables that try to explain behavior of students. In going to the mall. So he said knowledge about the mall is the first one. Peer influence and then income of the student. It's not writing behavioral control, it's right income of the student. So he said knowledge, peer influence, income will inform what intention. But the ability to stay in the mall for a longer time will be what? Informed by income. Somehow he's also arguing that the knowledge about the mall will be mediated by age. In fact, it's supposed to be moderated if I'm right. So it maybe it should come here. Now, whichever way, for this particular, it looks like it's maybe you can say that somehow there could be age can be a factor that can mediate the relationship between. Um, if I should be moderate, so it should we moderate the relationship between knowledge and intention? That means that people of a higher age may are more likely to be found the more or not, which can be tested. So you can say that age has an influence. On the relationship between the knowledge about the mall and the intention. And it's true. One thing that you see in Ghana is quite a, a particular age group are always found on the mall, especially, especially during the vacations when the schools are on break. You see a lot of youth between 30 and 14 years old to about 18 years old spending so much time at the mall. So, and an age group which is post 60, you, you barely see them in the mall. So you can see that the age has an influence on the knowledge about the mall or the intention to even go into the mall, go to the mall. So that's what can be somebody studying. Now this is just factors put together. It doesn't mean that they are actually working. So he's, he's suggesting that he may go to the mall and find out that for a particular mall, this mall is for the elderly and you may never find any youth there. So there could be other outcomes that could come up based on this particular model. But at least you can appreciate that this is a person trying to do a study on the imp um, student's visit to the mall. So he has been able to come up with this conceptual framework. Good. Now, conceptual frameworks are in their form analytical schemes. Why? Why? They try to, they try to simplify reality to make it easier to discuss and analyze or research on. 
So students going to the mall, how can you break it down for people to understand? I can break it down by trying to say that there could be factors that could lead to students going to the mall, which are interrelated. The knowledge about the mall, peer influence, and income. That's all. Now, so they simpl simplify reality by selecting certain phenomenon, so phenomena or variables and suggesting certain relationships between them. Suggesting. You see, a theory has observed or a theory talks about apparent relationships which have been observed. However, a conceptual framework talks about certain suggested. Okay. So let's look at different types of conceptual frameworks. Now, the different types of conceptual framework can help you to even understand the different type of theory. Because a conceptual framework, after a lot of research, getting empirical grounding, then becomes a theory in the future. So a conceptual framework, cause and effect. Cause and effect are usually characterized by factors that lead to a particular phenomenon. So you see a set of factors that point into one outcome. You usually say causes and effect. So you said that's a cause and effect framework or cause and effect model. So this is a, a factor-based model is usually a cause and effect model. There are some causes that are leading to a particular effect. So sometimes, and from reading your research, uh, your literature, you can actually develop a conceptual framework which is built out of factors leading to a particular effect or a cause and effect model. Causes leading to an effect, which is very, very simple. And it's easy for students to be able to develop that within their or researchers to be able to develop that out of literature review. And conceptual framework can sometimes come in stages in the process. Means that there are steps, stage one, or phases, phase one, phase two, phase three. And the sequence can be linear or cyclical. For example, this is done by Dixon in 1994 in his book, in a book that she wrote about learning, organizational learning. And she talked about the organization learning cycle. We talks about the fact that there are certain four steps that if you, if you want to be able to increase knowledge or disseminate knowledge in organizations you have. Generating of knowledge of information from different sources, integrating the information within the organization context, interpreting it, and giving employees the ability to act on the information. So these are the four steps that you see they are in going up and down. Out of it, it has what we call the theory of meaning structures. It was used to modify, it was modified to get this organization learning cycle. Now the theory of meaning structure says that there are several meanings in society or in any particular community. Now, there are private meanings, means that things that individuals like to keep for themselves and they will not share, or they would like to share it only when they feel like they want to share it, so that there are no threats around them. Or they may not share here, but they may share in another place. So they are private meaning they hold to themselves. And then there is what we call um, collective meaning. Collective meaning is what as a group, we hold collectively. So like minutes in a meeting, a company can have minutes. Means that what we generally agree happened at the meeting, the meeting that occurred last week or last two weeks. So we call them collective meaning structures. Culture of an organization is a collective meaning structure. As for this organization, every Thursday we wear pink. And that's our meaning structure. Our colors are gold and red. Those are meaning structures. So they are part of it. Then. According to the theory of meaning structures, through which we build the organization learning cycle, learning occurs when we put in measures to allow people to have confidence in sharing their private meaning or allow people to have confidence in challenging the collective. So learning occurs in accessibility of meaning structures, accessibility. So when you make it accessible, and how do you make it accessible? Through these four steps. When you make more meaning accessible, people can learn, which is true. I make my meaning accessible by giving you a book or this video for you to listen to. So learning lies in the accessibility of what? Meaning or knowledge. So according to the meaning structures, the more you make learning, uh, um, make meanings accessible to others, learning can occur. But for it to become accessible, it means that you should be able to generate the information from different sources within your organization, integrate it within the specific content you should work. It's not all the information that's relevant to somebody. Give them ability to interpret it because what a manager may see out of a report, a subordinate may not see. And then give them the ability to act on that meaning. So we have generation, integration, interpreting, and acting. That helps to make meanings more accessible. And this is what you is term as an organizational learning cycle. Now, that is a, a, a very good um, research framework which you can use. Now, it's conceptual in nature. 
He built it from the chair of structure, but now it's a conceptual framework that others have been testing. Good. So meaning, um, this thing postulated it out through her book on, um, on organizational learning. Then this is another research framework, which is also in stages. Stage one, mo adapt mobile phones. Stage two, apply it to a particular activity. Stage three, what benefits will you get? Stage four, impact. So you see, it's moving in phases, phase one, phase two, phase three. So we call it a stage-based model. So sometimes a person or a researcher can express a particular set of factors in society or trying to use them to predict a particular phenomenon in a stage-wise form or a step-wise form, that this is how they occur. Now, sometimes others are based, based on hierarchy. And one of the most popular ones is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which some of us have known about it for since we in high school. Physiological, safety, belonging, self-esteem, and self-actualization. Different phases of um, different phases of needs that at every point in time in an organization, not everybody will be at the same level. And we can have, even within a, a group, we can all have, we may be working together, but we all have different levels of needs or different meanings that we may bring to our, what we may say as being important to us. So for someone, Within the group, he's all he's looking for belonging. But another person within the same group is looking for self-esteem. So all these different needs may, as employees, can influence their motivation to work in an, an office context. So if you, as a manager, are not able to appreciate that all these employees have different sets of needs, what you think is that because you think that everybody needs safety, you may increase salary and by, it may not still give somebody belonging. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Maybe the person who, who is getting belonging needs more time off to go and get married. And because of the nature of the work, you're not giving him that time off. So no matter how much happy he is, no matter how much money you're paying the person, try letting the person travel over the country, his relationship is in trouble. And he's not able to build a good relationship with his family or with his fiancée. And because of that, he's still not happy or satisfied. And he's still putting re a resignation letter. However, for another person, it's about self-esteem. He wants more responsibility to feel empowered in his workplace. And that person is about self-actualization. He has achieved self-esteem. He wants to feel actualized. He wants to go beyond the company and start imparting knowledge outside the company so that he can feel actualized. Now, everybody has different sets of needs at every point of time in their life. So at one point of time in your life, you can be at self-esteem. But another point in time in, li in, in your life, you could actually come down to safety. Especially a person, like a, a father who has a newborn, maybe think more about safety, concern. On his, uh, anytime he's thinking, leaving an office, he's thinking about the safety of his child. Yeah, so at that time, the child has been born, within the very first three months. So much, much of his needs are on safety and security and then freedom from fear, that stability, that he can, so that he can have a, um, uh, some confidence in working when it comes to work. And that person may be thinking of something else. For example, a lady could go to, in some African context, a lady can go and achieve all her master's education, finish it, and because she's not married, she still doesn't have self-esteem. She may have two degrees, but still doesn't have self-esteem because in that community, self-esteem is built by being married, not being having a degree. In a different community, it may be about having a degree. So you can have 10 children and you still don't feel like have any self-esteem. You still think you have to go back to school to build some self-esteem for yourself. Good. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs helps us to understand that even in an, um, an organizational context, employees could have different sets of needs. And it's good for the a supervisor to be able or a manager to be able to identify these needs and address them in appropriate ways. Now, maps and coordinates. Sometimes conceptual frameworks may be shown as maps and coordinates which shows how they relate together. A very common example is the demand and supply curve, which you all know about in economics. So quantity is here and price is here. And you have a equilibrium at this point. You have a demand and supply curve, which is used to understand um, how market systems work. So this is one way. And you can see there's the x-axis and then there's a the y-axis. So at least you can appreciate that there's some maps and coordinates working here. OK, then you can also have other conceptual frameworks that are built on gap analysis. Gap analysis try to show a discrepancy between one thing and the other. Good. 
So you may see like this particular model is called the self core model, which is used in marketing a lot. The self core model is a service quality model. It's a multi item skill developed to assess customer perceptions of service quality. Now, it talks about the fact that um, service quality is a discrepancy between a customer's ex expectation for a service offering and the customer's perceptions of the service he, he receives. So what you expected and what you receive, the gap between it helps you to be able to establish the service quality of that particular service that you are evaluating. And it has a number of variables and components postulated in the literature to be able to study every type of service. Some of this, this particular conceptual model has been applied to medi medical uh, in the health sector, has been applied in business, has been applied even in teaching and education. For all of them, for each of them, they have different variables that they, you can come up with. Good. Service quality is evaluated by answering a number of questions about your expectations and about what you received. Good. Now, sometimes there are other forms of quality that are discussed in literature. There's technical quality and functional quality. Technical quality means that the technical quality of the item that you actually receive. For, for example, you go to a restaurant and you are given a meal to eat. Good. Now, the functional quality may have to do with the packaging of the food and the function of the service that is being given to you. So you look at it, oh, this is interesting. It was served well in a neat plate. There was, um, it was served on time. And, and what you requested was what was brought to you, what I was given to you, and the waiter was courteous. But if you start eating and the food is not good, the technical quality has failed. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So in Ghana, there's a joke that talks about that goes on that you can see sometimes on Sunday afternoons by you, you see some um, eating joints or or what we may call uh, local restaurants we call them chop bars in Ghana and some of them are situated by unsanitary places by a gutter an open gutter and the place may have a stinking smell but you see people with uh, Range Rovers BMWs, Benzes have packed there and they are going to eat in this particular joint. And you ask, why are they going to still eat there? And they'll tell you that the functional quality may not be good, but the technical quality of the food there is very good. So they go there for the technical quality, not for the functional quality <laughs> of the service. Anyway, good. Now, what are the building blocks of a theory? Every theory has components. So let's go into theory a little bit. We talk about conceptual frameworks. Let's talk about theories now. We said that a theory is an organized or co coherent and systematic articulation of set of issues communicated as a meaningful whole. It means that there are certain components that come together to explain a phenomenon and the f so that the phenomenon will be better understood in society or can be predicted. Now, theories provide complex and comprehensive conceptual understanding of things that cannot be pinned down. For example, how societies work, how organizations operate, or why people interact in or act in a particular way. Well, you don't know why people go to the mall and behave in a particular way, but by showing you the theory of plant behavior, you can use it to be able to understand why they are acting that way. That's what we mean by that. Now, every theory that we use in research, whether um, it, help, it helps us to be able to design a research question. If the same thing applies to conceptual frameworks, they both help us to be able to design a research question or select which particular data you need to collect. We, I showed an example of unemployment, and I mentioned a low wages. So if you are trying to study on un unemployment, you can st ask questions on low wages or political instability. Good. It helps you to interpret the data and propose explanations of causes of influences of the phenomenon you are studying. So with that theory, sometimes in research, you are open to too many ifs um, and possibilities. Because you didn't get, get a theory to guide you to frame what you are doing so that you can have the limits of the research. Because if you are studying an issue like poverty and you just jump into the field, there could be so many dimensions of issue, that multiple factors that could influence poverty. And even depends on which discipline you are originating from. An economist's definition of what causes poverty may could be something different from what a social scientist may say or, 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 or an anthropologist may say. So we always have to have an open mind that as we are doing research, let us ask ourselves, what discipline are you coming from? And from what theoretical lens are you using to evaluate the issue? Good. Now, every theory, to be able to be applicable 
to other issues of life and explain them has a number of components. The first thing is that a theory always has abstract concepts specified at a high level of abstraction chosen to specifically explain the phenomenon of interest. You say here the theory of planned behavior. We didn't say attitude towards going to the mall. We say attitude towards a behavior. So an abstract concept like attitude, perceived behavioral control, like intention, like subjective norm, without the specifics in them, they rely at the abstract. When it's more abstract, you can make it more apply. You can apply it to different scenarios to be able to make meaning. Good. Every theory has propositions, means that associations between the constructs. So the theories don't just leave the construct just lying there. They have associations. Attitude can influence intention. Subjective norm can influence intention. Perceived behavioral control can influence intention, but can also influence the actual performance of the behavior. So there are relationships. You see, because theory should talk about the factors or the variables or constructs and how they interact or relate in explaining the phenomenon you are studying. So every theory has relationships in them. And theories have logic. They say relationships should make sense. They should explain something. Logic. Logic acts as a group that connects the theoretical constructs and provides meaning and relevance to the relationships between these constructs. They should act as a group, come together to explain something. So a theory should seek to explain something. So we have a, the theory of planned behavior seeks to predict a person's behavior. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So Theory should seek to explain something. When we say um, area of a triangle is, pi, um, is uh, half base times height, it means that the half of the base times the height come together to make what? The area of the triangle. So they should seek to explain something. Otherwise, the fact the constructs are there, the propositions are there, but what are they leading to? And the last part is that all theories are constrained by assumptions and have about values, time, and space, and boundary conditions that govern where the theory can be applied and where it cannot be applied. A theory cannot explain everything. The theory of planned behavior cannot explain area of a circle. So a theories always theories always have boundaries where we apply them and at what level we apply them. Theory of planned behavior is for understanding individuals, not for understanding a nation. You can't use it to study a nation. But you can use it to study a president and who is an individual. You can, you can use it to understand individual behavior, not that of a nation. So theories act at different levels and they have assumptions. Theories assume that this and this is like this before this will work. So whenever you apply a theory, you have to understand the boundary conditions of the theory, the assumptions of the theory, so that you can be able to look at the logic and the propositions. These propositions are sometimes called hypotheses because they see me putting H1, H2, and H3. Another thing that is not written here but it's also important is that theories are parsimonious. Now, when we say theories are parsimonious, it means that they explain a lot of things with few things. So, most of the time, the variables within a theory are very few, but they're trying to explain a very large concept. They don't try to put so many variables and it becomes confusing. So they try to use a few things to explain a very big thing. Okay. So let's see examples of theories. In a where can we find theories? There are different ta databases of theories. So you can use these URLs, www.tinyurl.com slash business theories or slash finance theories. You can also ask your supervisor and can give you a, a direction to where you can find theories. But let's look at examples. In economics, there are different types of theories. Arbitrage, Arbitrage um, pricing theory, rational choice theory, prospect theory, Gordon model. So most of them, some finance students have come across them. Then you also have modern portfolio theory, which proposes how rational investors should use diversification in order to optimize their portfolios. It discusses how a risky asset should be appraised. And then there are certain types of theories which are comes from there's a school of thought, economic cycles or systems, growth and economic systems as you see there. For example, you may find out that you have classical, Marxism, Keynesian, neoclassical synthesis, Australian school. It's a school of thoughts that try to explain economic systems. For example, you cannot go, you see, I said theories at a different level. So when you look at a, a system of thinking or economic system like capitalism, I cannot go and say you are capitalism. 
you as an individual can be said you are a, you exhibit capitalism nature so you have got um yeah, capitalist. But you as an individual cannot become capitalism. Capitalism is more of an economic system. But you can be a person in it and practicing what the economic system requires you to do. Then we can say you are a capitalist. Hope you get the two different things. Good. So you have got growth, economic cycle, schools of thought, economic systems. Then global trade, choice, and then markets, and then tax and spend policies. There are so much of them for economics and finance. Then when you go to accounting, there are different types of approaches that have been used in accounting theory. Events approach, behavioral approach, human information processing approach, predictive approach, positive approach. And quite a number of accounting students who come across them throughout their course of work or throughout their learning. For that for an example is financial statements reporting. There are two approaches. There's a value approach and events approach. Each of them have a different, different definition of what the relevance of an income statement. For example, in the value approach, an income statement is perceived as an indicator of financial performance of the firm for a given period. However, in the events approach, an income statement is seen as a direct communication of operating events that occur over a, different, a given period. So these are different approaches to, and it means that they may, in terms of evaluating or, or doing your financial statements reporting, a person for a value, a value approach may have a different view than a person from an events approach. For example, in another words, an events relevance, an, an events relevance rather than its output on cash flow determines reporting of an event in the statement of cash flow for an events approach. So the events relevance, if it's not relevant, may not show on the financial statement. Not more about its output or impact on the cash flow. Then there is a monomative events theory of accounting. Which, look, which is also quite different. And quite a number of accounting students also come across it. Now, I'm just giving overviews. So I'll mention another other ones in marketing too. Marketing has got a hierarchy of effects theory. That's a series of steps a consumer goes through. So you see this one is stepwise. And, and it's, it's based on a hierarchy. So a hierarchical. So you see, think, feel, do. You have awareness, knowledge, liking, preference, conviction, and purchase. So what, uh, what steps do you... What hierarchy of steps do a consumer go to in order to make a choice or a decision to purchase a product? This is what the theory says. Then there's a self car model which we talked about earlier. Marketing also tends to borrow from other forms of management. There's structure, conduct, performance model, efficiency perspective, portals models, which are in strategic management, can also sometimes apply to marketing. The resource-based view, strategic management, also applied to marketing. Institution theory from social systems also applied to marketing. Since the marketing borrows from everybody. <laughs> then the generational theory. I think some of you have heard about generation Y, generation X. This is called, it comes from generational theory which holds consumers, the theory, the theory holds that consumers born of the same generation defined as a 20 year period have common attitudes and behaviors. Like we say there's a millennials, this born after 1979, then there's generation Y, the baby boomers, then generation X. Good. Now, most of the generational theory are done by, type of research are done by pure research, which if you go to their website, you can find much more about what they say concerning the different generation per what social phenomenon they are studying. Then there's the almighty or very popular game theory, which is a mathematical concept, actually, that analyzes how strategic interactions between individuals or agents produce outcome based on agent choices. And this is actually applied in finance, too, and other forms of um, this is other, other knowledge disciplines within management. Marketing, too, sometimes can have theories which are more specific to a particular knowledge area. So there are theories in consumer behavior. There are theories in relationship marketing, like commitment trust theory. There are theories in corporate social responsibility, like the stakeholder theory have been used to study corporate social responsibility a lot. And there's service marketing, a uh, self car model, and there's entrepreneurship, which are the, theory, the theories of entrepreneurship, like necessity, is something that is there. And then um, you can also have theories in management. Theories in management, most of the popular ones are Maslow's, the theories of monetary motivation, Taylorism, which talks about how managers should break down production to series of small tax so that people can enjoy what they do and can be given some sense of relevance in what they do. So 
they put for a tailor put forward the idea that workers are motivated mainly by pay. So how does it inform how you, you do your job design? Then there is Hesbeck. Hesbeck talks about how do we influence or motivate employees. And it look, looks at two factors, the motivators and the hygiene factors. So there are certain factors that business could do or introduce to motivate employees to work harder. So motivators are concerned with the actual job itself. For instance, how interesting the work and how much opportunity is given for extra responsibility, recognition and promotion. Hygiene factors are more about the factors that surround the work. Like, have you been given a computer, laptop? <laughs> you're laughing. <laughs> have you been given reasonable pay? So irrespective of the responsibility you're giving to the person, if you're not giving the conducive environment to work, you may not be happy. So there are two-factor model for um, looking at theory and for motivation uh, according to Hesbeck. Then you also have, okay, Hesbeck talks about motivating employees by adopting a democratic approach to management and by improving the nature and content of actual job through certain methods. Some of them are job enlargement, job arrangement, and empowerment. Okay, then there's Maslow's School of, school of um, Needs, or where he talks about the physiological needs of employees, and that there are five levels of human needs which needs to be fulfilled at work. A business should therefore offer different incentives to workers in order to help them fulfill each need in turn. And, and, and turn and progress up the hierarchy. Managers should recognize that workers are not all motivated the same way. I emphasized that earlier. So this is it. We talked about it earlier. Then, then in public administration, administration, we have new public management, which talks about ways of modernizing the public sector. So, and some of them talks about the fact that some of the tools or some of the hypotheses within public new public management school of thought talks about the fact that you should market orientation of management trying to make sure that the public sector now becomes a place that is much more customer centric and decentralized not that large one big item that trying to do everything by itself so much of the characteristics of mpm is that you see that in public sectors that have adopted mpm you see budget cuts accountability for performance privatization um, user charges, separation of politics from administration. And you, if you reflect back in Ghana, we have gone through that, especially when we're doing a lot of diversification. See privatization being there. And even some people even argue, in the, argue about the introduction of technology as ways or means of achieving the ideals of new public management. Good. But this is in the, those who are doing public administration. Information systems who has a number of different theories. But it tends to originate from social science and other disciplines. For example, you have the theory of, of um, plan behavior, which we borrow from social science. You have technology acceptance model. That talks about the fact that there are two things that can help to inform a person's acceptance of a technology. The perceived ease of use and the perceived usefulness. We can inform a person's attitude to perform a particular, adopt a particular technology. Then the diffusion of innovation, transaction cost theory, which I've actually used myself. And then from the strategic perspective, you have the resource-based theory. Now, there are every theory acts at different levels. We mentioned that. There's the micro level, the meso level, and the macro level. The micro level meaning that at, at the large level, you have individual. So some theories are more on the micro level, like the theory of plan behavior looks at individual behavior. Then you have the meso level that looks at organizations, theories of organizations. For example, one of the interesting things, interesting ones is the resource-based theory of a firm. That looks at how organizations gain competitive edge or advantage in their business sector or in their market by, by use of their resources. So the resource-based theory is one of the interesting ones that talks about how firms gain competition by the use of their resources. So valuable resources, and then you also have rare resources and then resources which are imperfectly mobile. They cannot be substituted and they cannot be perfectly copied. Good. Then you have got macro level theories, which looks at more of the, the national level or the country level or economic systems, like modernization theory, which look at society. You cannot use modernization theory to study an organization. It can study a society. So whenever you're applying a theory, ask yourself, are the constructs there? Even a model, if you are the coming up with your own conceptual model, ask yourself, are the constructs there? Are the propositions there, or the hypothesis or the relationship between the constructs there? Does it have a logic, something that pulls all these elements together? 
what are the boundary consumption what assumptions have you made for that particular conceptual framework or what are the assumptions of that particular theory at what level are you applying it at the micro level meso level or macro level if your research question is about factors that influence child trafficking evidence from victims then you know you are actually looking at individual level so you have to know what kind of factors that you you point out there could be interaction of different factors that can be inform what is happening in the at the lower level but you have to be very careful in the choice of your factors so that's how the level of the theory well, at what level does the theory work micro level meso level and macro level good so we have come to the end of t theories and research frameworks theories and conceptual frameworks which together comes out to become our research framework. In summary, we mentioned that research frameworks are frame research. They give us the variables for which we can use to explain or study our social phenomenon. And then, then it helps us to, be able to come up with our research questions and even inform our research design. You can either use a theory or you can use a conceptual framework. Or you can even modify a theory to even form a conceptual framework. It means that your conceptual framework can be built out of a theory or can be built out of literature or a combination or maybe both. Or you can pick a theory as is and use in your research. But whatever you are doing, each of them, so for course, whether it's conceptual or theoretical, they are all framing your research. So we call them a research framework. So don't be so much confused. Some supervisors can confuse and say, where's your research framework? Where's your conceptual framework? Where's this? But sometimes you need to understand what it's actually asking for. It's your research framework is asking for. So you understand that for every research you are doing, try to find out what research framework is guiding them. Some research are done without research framework, like exploratory research can start without any research framework, but just guided by questions and then just step in. It's not necessarily wrong, but you should always understand what is the objective of your research. What is the research seeking to contribute? And why is the person using this framework? Why is, what, why is he not using this other framework? And whenever you're applying a research framework, whether theoretically or conceptually, ask yourself, does it really answer the research question? Does it really have the variables that address the research question? If not, you change them or you introduce those necessary variables to address the research question. Thank you for listening to me, and I hope you have enjoyed the session. The next time we meet, we'll talk about methodology. <laughs>